uh, looking over to Feather River, looking uh, generally south. And it's a hot day in late November. It hasn't rained in months. I think we got about 90 seconds of rain, at least uh, down in the Bay Area, a couple days ago. But it was more just like fog that got too thick and then kind of, you know, like I said, it started raining. It only rained for about 90 seconds. Not enough to even wipe the pollution off the cars. Uh, anyway, you could see this is the area, uh, near the area, where the campfire, the famous campfire of November 1st, maybe it was the 2nd or 3rd, I forget, early November 2018, massive wildfire in California, uh, killed about uh, a little bit less than 90 people. Uh, it basically started behind me and then burned that way, just jumped into ridges, it spurred on by the hot winds and a complete lack of rain. It used to start raining about mid-October, in California, you know, and I, and I know this just from talking to some of my uh, older friends who have been botanists and horticulturalists in the area for well over four decades, you know, and they, they've noticed the, the, the change in the temperature and the precipitation and the arrival of precipitation. Uh, it's, it's no mystery to them. It's, it's glaringly obvious what's going on. The climate's changing. Uh, I know that triggers a lot of the grandpas out there, so I'll, I'll try not to do it too much. You don't want to have them to have a, you know, get them to have a heart attack or anything, but, uh, Anyway, again, here we are, uh, late November, it hasn't rained, we did get rain the last two years, uh, you know, we got dumped on 2017, prior to that we had the same thing as we do now, about four years of just intense drought, uh, too little rain, not enough, uh, very, very shit quality of Sierra snowpack, not, almost no snow one of those years, I remember, it felt like it does now in January, I think that was like 2015, maybe 2014, it felt really uh, scary actually, because it, the whole climate just the whole landscape is just drying out so uh and it's mostly due to a high pressure system off the west coast of california that just it's all that cool descending air that just diverts rain around it you know it just acts like a big you know fucking pillar and all the storms just go to the north or maybe even to the south mostly to the north i think oh uh, yeah look so this is a nice outcrop of ultramafic rock 150 million year old ultramafic rock slapped on to the edge of uh, what was then no the North American continent by a subduction zone, and then, you know, here it's been subsequently uplifted and what the shit. Some wonderful exposures of serpentine a little further down the road. But I want to show you this member of the sunflower family, Asteraceae. Here's a, a species of Lysingia, probably Nemoclata. See that? You can tell it's a sunflower family member. You can see the phyleries right there, basically that green tube at the base of the flower. See those little roofing shingle-like bracts on it? pointing up those are the phyleries those are you definitely need to get pictures of the phyleries if you're trying to figure out what the hell species of composite aka asteraceae uh, or sunflower you're looking at obviously this isn't a sunflower sunflower pertains to the genus helianthus uh, which of course is far a little bit further away on the sunflower family tree from this genus lysingia but uh yeah, i just call it the sunflower family anyway get up close and uh, you can see those uh corollas are pretty distinct you know so again, you got multiple florets inside a larger uh, flower head. So what looks like a flower is actually a composite flower. That's why they call it composite family. Uh, composed of tiny, you know, probably five or six right here, tiny individual flowers, each one with a little fan-shaped corolla. Okay, there's an individual flower that I took out of that Lysingia. You know, there's about four or five of those in one of those heads. You can see it's a the corolla has uh, five lobes to it, a little fan-shaped flower, kind of like those uh, Goudiniaceae, its sister family down there in uh, Australia. And then you can see I left one of the flowers in that head, so see, there's there's one that I didn't remove. See, there's two two flower heads I didn't remove the flowers from, the individual florets from, and then here's one I took the flower out of. Just got one little floret left in there. So you can see it's a composite flower. There's there's quite a few individual flowers packed into that little uh, uh, capitulum right there. This capitulum is, you know, the, the word for a... Uh, or sudantium is another one. Both words referring to a, a basically a, a bunch of flowers aggregated into one to make it look like a single flower head, which is the trademark of the sunflower family. You know, you look at a sunflower, of course... It looks like one one single flower, but it's actually got hundreds of tiny flowers in there. These only have five or six. Anyway, there you go, Lysingia. So look at it, dry as a bone, almost late November. It's a beautiful madrone right there, the Arbutus menziesii, the uh, Ericaceae, the blueberry family. 
You can see all those beautiful red berries on it. And they are edible. Not very palatable, but edible. You could make a little drink out of them if you want. Each berry's got uh, quite a few seeds inside, which differs from the genus Camarostaphylus, which is another genus. You get that down in Southern California, and there's quite a few species in Mexico in Camarostaphylus. They got a sim They look a lot like madrones. They don't get as big, but uh, their berries only have one seed per uh, one seed per fruit, whereas the madrones got dozens. So this is our beautiful Menzesii. And down in Baja, you got Arbutus peninsularis. In Mexico, you got Arbutus halopensis. In Arizona, you got Arbutus arizonica. And then there's quite a few more species in Mexico as well. Hey, see, there's there's the berries right there. Again, kind of mealy. So let, let's see what's coming up. Even though it's bone dry, what's coming up uh, after the fire? How glandular this guy is, this snapdragon. Some sort of Kekiella or Antherinum. Mulling everywhere. Bad invasive, gotta rip that out. Oh, and some nice Aerodictyon. Glistening, waxy leaved. These guys like it hot and dry. You can see the bay trees are resprouting. Umbella Luria Californica. You got some Calacanthus, some spice bush over here. These are nice when they're flowering. They're not firing because it's they're flowering because it's dry as fuck, obviously. But uh, when they are, they got a really pretty red flower. One of the basal angiosperms. One of the earlier branching lineages of angiosperms. Bay trees, of course. California bay, related to the Mediterranean bay, the true the true bay, but uh, smells a bit different. Very pungent though. You crack those leaves open. Avocado family, uh, Loraceae. Holy shit, is it dry? There's some nice poison oak down there. Just tons of mullein just taking over. You can see how that's a pain in the ass, even though the hippies and the herbalists like it. It's a fucking awful plant, at least in the forest up here. It's some big leaf maple. And that's a goner. It's not going to be here in 50 years. It's going to be way too hot and dry for that guy. So this is one of my favorite California oaks. And I can't, you know, I can't see the leaves, but just looking at how big the goddamn acorns are, I already know it's Quercus chrysalopus, a.k.a. the canyon live oak. You can see, obviously, this was a, a huge food source for Native Americans, uh, you know, before they got uh, uh, exterminated and wiped out by a bunch of, a bunch of murderous pricks in the uh, 1800s. But you could just, I mean, look at how big those goddamn acorns are. They're, they're enormous. Canyon live oak Quercus chrysalopus. And it's got, the good, good identifying factor for it uh, is that it's got this kind of little yellow, uh, this little layer of uh, yellow tomentose fuzz on the abaxial surface of the leaf, a.k.a. the underside. Hey, there you go. There's a leaf that fell down. Quercus chrysalopus, you can see. Again, it's got just the, the, the slightest indumentum, a.k.a. the yellow fuzz, little layer of uh, yellow tomatose fuzz on the uh, abaxial surface there, the underside. The top side's pretty smooth. Hey, there you go. So this, this was an old mining claim. You can see the surrounding rock is serpentinite. One of the ultramafic rocks, abundant in magnesium and iron, but lacking in calcium and nitrogen. California State Rock right there. Sometimes it's got asbestos in it. Uh, anyway, the, there was a jade deposit there, supposedly. Sometimes you get jade with serpentine. But, uh, you know, I think someone was, was working it for a while, but I think they abandoned it. You could see they got the old board where they could nail uh, the no trespassing sign that you could just blatantly disregard up there. And then, of course, uh, you could see there's the power lines that started it all. It's uh, supposed that these are uh, these are the power lines where supposedly the uh, the campfire uh, got its uh, head start. Uh, you know where the little inferno made its debut, and then of course spread southwest. And one of the minerals you get with the serpentine, like I was showing you before, is this jade, aka Vesuvianite. And this is just on the road here. It just it just kind of you know forms. You get little deposits occurring with the serpentine, and it just kind of weathers out and. You'll find little bits and shit along the road. Red Lysingia, little purple bastards everywhere. There's even an Areophyllum, a.k.a. the woolly sunflower, in the, the hot November bleakness. Don't use the word bleak too much. Well, it's no coincidence. That's kind of my opinion on many things in the modern day. Uh, here you got that nice Selaginella. And it looks like a little, uh, maybe that's Aspidotus densa right there. But it's uh, Selaginella, of course, this is not dead. It's dormant. So Lagenellas have a remarkable ability to just come back uh, once uh, the onset of uh, moisture. Could, could you not? Hey, what are you doing? Could you get down? Jesus Christ, you're going hey, to break your ass. Whatever. Any jackass hyena. Anyway, so there's, a, again, it's a Lagenella. Uh, again, ancient lineage 
of uh, vascular plants in its own family. I think it's even in its own order, but they're all over the world, especially in the tropics. And this is our California one. You can see, just pull this little guy off right there. So that, again, that's not dead, just dry. Resurrection ferns are in the genus Selaginella as well. You get those in a, a Texas, West Texas and Nuevo Leon. But uh, because of this ability to uh, dry out and then just basically, you know, green up and unfurl and start photosynthesizing again at the slightest hint of rain, you know, the slightest amount of rain, uh, you know, they they do pretty well in these uh, dry climate areas. There we go. There's a beautiful outcrop of serpentine. Look at it. Look, it's shiny. That's not wet. That's just uh, the uh, normal uh, iridescence of, uh, of the goddamn rock. Again, California State Rock created... Uh, basically, it's subduction zones. It's a metamorphic rock. It's metamorphosed ocean crust. So it's ocean crust that's rarely ever exposed on the surface of the earth. But then when it goes down out of subduction zone, if you don't know what a subduction zone is, you, you really got to learn about that because it's, a, you know, integral to a Earth's geology as well as plate tectonics. So when it goes down on a subduction zone, the oceanic crust, it gets cooked, a.k.a. cooked at depth and a pressure and uh, heat it up a little bit, mix with a little bit of water. And then uh, you get the serpentine. It's very crumbly, unstable. It's funny when rich people build their homes on hillsides made of serpentine and then uh, are completely surprised when not only can they not get uh, anything to grow in their garden because the uh, serpentine forms a soil that's toxic to most plants, but also later on their uh, entire house uh, slowly starts subsiding uh, down the edge of the hill because it's a very, like I said, it's a very unstable rock. And you can see right there, I mean, I've broken my ass on serpentine many times and uh, used lots of bad judgment to ascend uh, serpentine rock faces just like this that I uh, should otherwise have stayed away, stayed away from. But, uh, you know, I've gone up there looking for rare plants because, uh, again, on serpentine you get a lot of rare plants. It, causes, it basically causes speciation of plants. Nice little facilia up there. Look at that guy. Okay, so look at that. You got this madrone just sprouting again. You can see the little bunches where the, the leaves are sh coming out of the shoots after the fire. It's all burned. Again, there's the infamous power lines. Somewhere along this line is where the fire started. <clears throat> the glory of privatization. Anyway, so, uh, you know, what you got is you get, you get the one-two punch of, uh, you know, catastrophic wildfires occurring more often. It's because there's more people here and uh, the rain comes a lot later. And then when the trees, if they do survive that, which a lot of them do because fire is a part of this landscape, uh, not to this extent, but if fire's been occurring here for thousands of years. So if the trees survive the fire, they, uh, they, they'll they re-sprout whatever the shit. And then, uh, of course, now they have to uh, deal with the fact that moisture comes too little too late. You know, you get the moisture arriving two months later than it has for probably well over the last few thousand years of uh history in California, and then it, uh, uh, you know, it arrives in the form of rain rather than snow, and uh, oftentimes it's not enough. The last two years we got a bunch of rain, it was really nice, really good. Four or five years prior to that we didn't get enough rain, if any. One year we, we didn't rain the whole fucking month of July, it was super bleak, or January, excuse me, it was super bleak, and, uh, and then of course, you know, the summers are completely dry, so the hottest time of the year is also the, the driest part of the year. I'm gonna, you know, I'm just gonna go out on a limb here and say all the forests in California are gunners. You know, who knows how things will turn out, but as it stands now, if this trend continues, these forests aren't going to be here much longer. Anyway, moving right along, here's an Empilobium canum, evening primrose family. Now, this bastard's a stunner. You know, hot and dry. It's the hottest, driest time of the year, but these are going off. They're blooming, unaffected uh, by the, the drought or the heat at all. This is what makes these great garden plants, especially if you live in California, you want a uh, maintenance-free garden. Empilobium, evening primrose family. Look at that. You got all those little white stamens in there. The male parts and then that big red uh, antenna that's longer than the stamens, that's the, uh, the style and stigma. You know, the pistil is, is the aggregation of the uh, stigma style ovary. But, uh, of course, uh, what you mostly see, uh, you know, when you're looking at a pistil are the style and the stigma. The style is basically the stalk that holds the stigma up. So, but pistil with an I. So it's not like a dong. It's counterintuitive. That's how I always remember the word pistil is female. Because, you know, you hear pistil, you think dick. But it's not. It's, uh, you know, basically the opposite of that. Oh. Yeah, there you go. There's a little close-up of those flowers. Again, evening primrose family, four petals, and uh, inferior ovary. That just means the uh, ovary is... Uh, the ovary occurs, the fruit occurs beneath the uh, point of attachment of the petals. Very steep terrain. How'd you like to break your ass on that? 
little uh, artist formerly known as Mimulus up there, the Plakis or the monkey flower. Oh, look at that. Nice member of the chicory tribe there. See, each one of those rays, each one of those little petals is technically its own flower. You can see the phyleries are pretty elongated. And, of course, they got the milky wax, too. It's so it's so milky. The latex. And then, of course, uh, you know, the whole the whole tribe, Sycoroidiae. I think the whole tribe uh, has uh, those five teeth. You can see the ends of those rays, the distal ends of those rays, you got five teeth. As opposed to three, which is, you know, what the ligules, a.k.a. the rays of the rest of the sunflower family has. Okay, so you can see now we're on the granite, which is, of course, uh, decomposing. You can see the little bits of mica and what they shit in there. Beautiful phacelia. Don't know if that's phacelia histata or not, but uh, you can see the leaf rosette alone is just as beautiful as the flower. Baraginaceae is the family on that one. This is the artist formerly known as Mimulus. Now it's the Plachis or Antiochus. Rather large corolla on this guy, too. A.K.A. the monkey flowers. Everybody knows that. And here you go. Here's a... See a note. It's kind of odd to see it blooming right now. It is dry as hell. Okay, looking out over more dead and dying forests in Northern California. We're actually at the scene of where the campfire started. The infamous campfire of November 10. Look at that central tower right there. Notice how uh, the left arm of that central tower on a hill is missing. Uh, what happened, and we'll have to use this tower over here to illustrate it, is uh, you can see those arching wires, those are called cross arms, and they're held on to either side of the main line, the three main lines on this tower, say, by things called C hooks, after the letter C. Uh, and basically what the cross arm does is that it ensures that the power runs from uh, either line, on, or line to line on either side of that tower, on either side of those ceramic insulators, and then runs through the cross arm and continues on on the other side of that tower. Now what happened uh, over there is that basically one of the C hooks broke on the cross arm, so that cross arm was just dangling down, and uh, it formed an arc, which is basically a massive lightning bolt, uh, which then uh, started this fire. That electricity's got to go somewhere. It was no, run no longer running through the line, so it just ran into the ground, and of course it was uh, an extremely windy day. It had rained uh, in quite some time, and it was, uh, again, those winds really, th those winds play a massive part in these wildfires. And so uh, once uh, that giant lightning bolt uh, formed and started a little brush fire, it just spread west. The, the winds that they were blowing from east to west, remember wind is just cold air flowing towards warm air, colder, denser air flowing, fo flowing towards warmer, less dense air, and so the winds just acted like a blow dryer, essentially uh, burning, uh, you know, west into the town of uh, Paradise, which is as the crow flies, it's over a couple ridges, but as the crow flies, you know, it's only about 10 miles away, uh, devastated the town, killed 90 people, uh, it was just a fiery inferno, uh, and a, I think it destroyed four towns in total, but uh, it didn't spread to the east, it was just inching to the east, but to the west it just raged, and uh, there you go, that's the campfire. Okay, so, you know, a lot of people want to blame PG&E. They, they certainly bear some of the responsibility. I don't know if they're delaying maintenance, looking for the cheapest bid. You know, that's just kind of what the system is set up for. You know, spend as little as possible to make as much money as possible. But certainly the weather plays a huge part, too. These winds are incredible, extremely fast. You know, living in a state as populated as California with 44 million people, you know, having the hottest time of the year be also the driest part of the year. And then, of course, you're not getting, you're getting rain two months later than you have you know, in the past, the rain doesn't start till, you know, off in December now. Some some years it didn't even come at all. And then, of course, again, those winds. Those winds, you can see these lines, they're, they're tense, but, you know, they're held pretty taut. But the winds just can cause so much friction. And especially these lines, are they're over 100 years old. 1906, these were built. You know, they need a little, uh, <laughs> they need some maintenance. So anyway, it's, uh, it's going to happen again. It's going to continue happening. There's too many people, not enough water. And, of course, the weather's all fucked up, even though some people don't want to admit it. So, uh, anyway, there you go. Campfire, central tower right there up on that hill. And there you go. So, you, you got uh, what you got up there is you got some uh, Douglas fir, Pseudosugum, and ZCI. Tends to lead a, need a little bit more moisture than the pines. There's Ponderosa pine up there, too. But uh, that Pseudosugum probably won't be here in 100 years. It's just going to be too dry for it. At least if we keep going at this rate, it's kind of a one-two punch. So you got forest fires, and then uh, the trees, even if they even if they survived the forest fires, like these black oaks uh, have done a great job at, they did survive. They're adapted to it. Well, then they've got to deal with the uh, reduced rainfall, the changed precipitation regimes. You know, 
rain and precipitation arriving two months later than it has for the past, I don't know, you know, however many hundreds of years of recorded history here, 150 years of recorded history, probably a lot longer than that too, you know, I mean, there's probably much uh, cooler winters, much colder winters, much more moisture, uh, you know, 500 years ago than now. So, uh, and again, just uh, greatly exacerbated by climate change, by people pumping a heat-trapping gas into the atmosphere. You know, I, I know that I know that triggers people. I know it does. You know, I, I don't give those people much uh, legitimacy because they don't really know what they're talking about. Few of them are scientists, and uh, you know, they just—I I think they just don't like climate change because it portrays a view of the world they don't like. It just portrays that we have to change things, and that the current way we're doing things is detrimental to the common good, and uh, and so. You know, rather than just deal with the facts and alter your outlook or change your behavior, people just uh, try to face the, you know, fuck with the facts. And I just can't imagine, you know, the hubris it must take to think that you know more, even though you're an accountant or, you know, you spend your life selling insurance or some shit like that, you know, or designing airplane wings, whatever. And no offense to anybody in those professions, but I just can't imagine the fucking arrogance it must take to spend your life doing that and think that you somehow know more than people who've you know, devoted their entire careers to studying things like atmospheric physics, uh, paleoclimate, uh, climatology, etc. You know, it just, I, it's like going into a doctor's office and, you know, he tells you you got cancer, they need to operate, you start telling them how to operate on you. You know, like you're going you're gonna to argue with a team of surgeons on how to fucking address uh, your lymphoma or the tumors growing in your lungs? I don't, I don't get it. Oh, who doesn't love a silene? Karyophyllaceae. The Pink Family. How glandular that shit is. Opposite leaves. Okay, so look at the flower morphology of this silene. Okay, you got five fringed petals. There's one, pull this, there's, okay, there's one, two, three, four, five. I can't really pull it down with only one hand. Yeah, you get the idea. So there's five of those, and then the interesting thing to look at here is that you got three styles. So three, three, uh, basically three, uh, pistols. Only one ovary, but three, uh, three pistols, three styles. The stigma, that's the female receptive part, those little antennas. And of course, I've peeled back the stamens here. You can't see them. You got, remember, you got stigma, style, ovary. And again, just heavily glandular with these, uh, well, that's the calyx, those those little green bricks right there. Calyx, and then a five-petaled corolla. So the Manzanita's coming back. Nice arc, those Staphylos uh, regenerate. Looks like either it's either uh, Visita or uh, uh, Glaca. Nice looping over there, too. Anyway, you can see just the entire slope composed of mostly dead trees. I guess a couple survived on that ridge right there, but uh, these forests are goners. You think they're coming back anytime soon? Especially when uh, weather patterns all fucked up, doesn't start raining till December. No? You're gonna get far less snow than you used to? Probably not. There's a lupin. What if that's albifrons? That silvery, the silvery leaves. And of course, you could just see the substrate here is just this uh, granite, just gradually eroding and weathering granite. It makes a nice sand. You can see how easily it just comes apart. Be curious to know the chemistry of this particular batch of granite. It looks like a nice Clarkia. At least what's left of it. A little fruit split open. Anyway, there's a Pinus ponderosa. Nice pondy that survived the fire. There's more of that granite. It really is a lovely substrate to grow on, especially if you're one of the acid-loving plants with the nice mycorrhizal affinity. It's such as this Arctostaphylos. So growing on the decomposing granite, and the gradually weathering granite. Look how look at this lupin. Look at how look at how fuzzy and tomatose it is. You got hairs on the stalks, super fluffy leaves. I'd love to see this bastard in flower. Got to come back in May, assuming we get any rain this goddamn year. Lupinus is such a diverse genus, so many goddamn species. But look how look how hairy that is. So canescent. Oh, 
Okay, so growing at the base of this dead oak tree, uh, you can see a huge colony of Armillaria malea, aka the honey mushroom, which uh, is supposedly edible, though I've never indulged uh, myself. You can just fry those up in some uh, butter, throw them with some pasta. Now, this is a parasitic mushroom. Well, it's saprotrophic, meaning it'll eat stuff that's already dead, but it's also a parasite. You know, it mostly seems to go for uh, compromised trees, trees that are already kind of drought-stressed or on their way out anyway. And it seems to be the case with this oak. That's why you had this massive flush, you know, a year after uh, this probably 90-year-old oak died. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe older than that. There's another massive oak, probably much older, dead down there. This is all Clarkia, evening primrose family. These are the fruits. The fruits split open, four-lobed fruits, and then uh, four-petaled flowers. So, you know, Northern California forests are in... They're kind of in dire straits. I think they're on their way out. I think it's going to look a lot different in 100 years. You think this is coming back anytime soon? Especially with the decreased rain, longer, hotter, drier summers. I don't know. Some nice salmon berry. Here you go. There's the salmon berries. Rosaceae rose family. Over here you got that uh, calacanthus. Again, the spice bush. Again, beautiful one of flowers. Big red flowers that kind of smell like... Uh, old port wine, you know? They're kind of a, a rotting wine smell to it. But speaking of mycorrhizae, which again just means fungi that are symbiotic with trees, here's a, either a suilus or some kind of bolete. You can see it's got the uh, the pores. No gills, just pores. And again, it's symbiotic with the oaks and the pines. There's another one of them right there. So the fire came through, took out about 60% of the trees in this patch, maybe a little bit more, maybe 70%, killed 70% of them, and the rest that it left now just have to cope with the fact that it's been, you know, seven months without rain now. And uh, and luckily they got some snowpack. The creek is still trickling over there, so it's not totally dry. But uh, there's no rain in the forecast for the next two weeks. It just It's an incredible uh, amount of stress to put on a plant. On a tree specifically, not to mention the fact that the entire canopy's been removed now, almost the entire canopy, because all the trees are dead. So now you have all this incoming solar radiation hitting the ground, heating it up, uh, moisture is evaporating a lot faster than it otherwise would. I'm surprised to see this guy blooming. This Clarky is still. Okay, remember I showed you the Clarky of fruits? There's the fruits, here's the flowers, even the primrose family, four petaled, four petaled flower with an inferior ovary. I mean, it just means that the ovary, a.k.a. the fruit, uh, occurs beneath the point of attachment of uh, all the flower, the perianth parts. And then, of course, you got that big purple knobby stigma on a style. Remember, the stigma is like the plant cervix, which is what, what receives all the pollen. clarky has got a lot of, lot of species in it. Beautiful genus. He's one of those uh, Campanulaceae. Got a, quite a prominent style on this guy, too. So stamens and style. I just think, you know, the style, again, it goes stigma, style, ovary. Those together form the pistil. Pistil is the female uh, part of the flower. But I always just say style because that's the most uh, prominent part. That's normally what you see. A style topped by a stigma. And then, of course, in the center there, you got the, and much more numerous, you got the stamens. Okay, so without being too much of a downer, I do want to say we're going to see a huge change in the landscape of California as time goes on. You know, by uh, next century, you know, I, I estimate probably half these forests will be gone. I mean, we weren't treating them too well to begin with. Look at, do me a favor, look at a satellite view of the northern Sierra Nevada along like Highway 108, uh, you know, Highway 50. You could see the chicken pox marks of different clear cuts just lining east to west, uh, the whole, uh, Sierra, you know, Sierra, northern Sierra Nevada mountain range, you know, of course, again, it's just clear cuts exposed on that land, the more solar radiation, less moisture, uh, more heat, and, uh, you know, and then, of course, you get, you know, the one too doozy from climate change coming through. You know, I just, I don't think a lot of these forests are going to be here anymore. Everything's moving north. The moisture regime, regimes are moving north. So, uh, yeah, I'm not trying to bum you out too much, but let's just keep it real, you know, be honest. Look at that entire... Uh, canyon of dead trees and this is very widespread too i mean there's these catastrophic wildfires every fall you know fire season lasts up until december now i mean cal fire just put out an alert for this area uh today 
So uh, we're still in the thick of it. No rain for another two weeks. Hey, you know, you could say the force are fucked there. We'll see. 44 million people. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of people and diminishing water reserves and just uh, might be more than the land can bear. But uh, I don't know. Anyway, hope I didn't bum you out too much. You have a lovely evening. Go fuck yourself. Bye.